Hello and welcome to this evening's Mansfield College Public Talk. For those people who don't know me, my name is Helen Mountfield. I'm uh, the principal of Mansfield College, um, but I'm particularly um, excited and pleased um, about this evening's speaker because um, my first degree was in history and then I was a lawyer for a long time before I became the principal of Mansfield. And this evening we have um, to speak to us a, a great um, historian and proponent of public um, oral history um, and also lawyer and uh, legal entrepreneur Dana, Dana Dennis Smith so it's lovely to see you here this evening Dana. Dana is a bit of a legend um, among women in the law um, because she is the person who uh, noticed um, that we needed to do something to um, mark, celebrate is perhaps the wrong word, but to mark um, the Sex Disqualification Removal Act 20. Uh, sorry, 1919, uh, the Sex Disqualification Removal Act was the act that removed um, the provision uh, that, or at least the, the, the decision of the Court of Appeal, uh, that a woman was not a person for the purposes of deciding who wanted to be a solicitor. That was decided in the case of um, Bebb and the Law Society. This is Gwyneth Bebb with her baby and my little picture of her that I always keep by my desk. Um, because Gwyneth Bebb was told she wasn't a person and she couldn't be a solicitor. Um, and then she prosecuted black marketeers all the, way, all the way through the First World War without being a solicitor. She was, after all, good enough to do that with her. What would have been a first-class degree from Oxford had she been able to get a degree, which she wasn't because um, Oxford didn't award women degrees at that time either. Um, but uh, she uh, did that. Uh, and then when the law was passed, um, she decided to um, apply to the bar, but... Um, sadly died in childbirth uh, soon after the birth of her second child and that always strikes me as a, a story that mattered about somebody who who fought through to bring a test case uh, in a fairly hostile environment and won the ultimate social battle although she lost uh, the litigation. So Dana um, is the founder of the First 100 Years Project which is what she's going to talk to us about this evening um, about the history of women in the law. Um, she's also um, the founder of Obelisk Support, which is a legal services provider, which offers flexible solutions to FTSE 100 and companies and, and law firms. So aiming especially at promoting diversity and getting excellent flexibility um, for legal services firms. And she's also the person who I hope she'll talk about this this evening, who um, got a fantastic piece of art um, into the Supreme Court. And we'll show that to you a bit later on about the representation of women. So Dana, welcome. It's really nice to see you this evening. Um, and uh, I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about your, your, your story, your own story, and, and why you came, why and how you came to found the First 100 Years Project. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And uh, well, I came to law a little bit later in life. Um, not unlike many of the legal pioneers, I have to say, who saw their dreams finally arrive when they're kind of in their late 40s and finally after many decades of battling to get to be qualified lawyers. Um, actually, this week we marked um, 99 years since Ivy Williams became the first woman to be called to the bar. So it's definitely a, a good week to be here to talk about women in law. So I, I joined the legal profession having been a journalist before and went into the city to train to be a solicitor. Um, and I guess, you know, I never really dreamt to be a lawyer as I was growing up. Um, I always had other answers to questions, you know, that you always get asked when you're a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? I never said I want to be a lawyer. But I guess once you enter the workplace, the real question that you are faced with is who do you want to be like um, in this firm, in this place of work? And really, un thinking if you like um, when I was practicing I didn't want to be like any of the people in that firm or any of the women that seemed to be senior and that kind of feeling I guess I took away with me when I left and I started doing some other things becoming an entrepreneur as you mentioned I came to when I returned to the legal profession three years after qualifying I came with a different value proposition around flexible work because I felt that was one of the reasons women were leaving and they were leaving in such huge numbers and I couldn't understand why we were educating girls and telling them to you know do really well at school and yet allowing them to disconnect from the work they trained so hard to be part of 
anyway, so all these kind of thoughts I had left behind, but then suddenly they resurfaced because of my business. I met so many women that didn't seem to be identifying with anybody in the legal profession. They were so, if you like, um, unbelonging. They didn't feel like they were part of it. Um, so these thoughts kind of were whirling around my head. And one day, I remember it was November 2013, I stumbled over this photograph that came in the alumni magazine of my husband, who's also a lawyer. And um, it was about a completely different subject. It was about a man. It was a double spread. And in the corner was this photograph with just the one woman in the middle. And there were about 60 men only, you know, black tie and this one woman. And I was thinking, wow. And I looked and I realized I was already alive at this point. It was 1982. And suddenly all these thoughts that I had collected as I was, you know, walking on these corridors of this city law firm suddenly just came rushing my head. And I thought maybe when did women start? And I realized, you know, when I started researching 1919 was this gateway that we were, you know, and even then we started with this disadvantaged story. Disqualification was the word. It wasn't like an empowering opportunity. It was a kind of begrudging opening of the gate. And I thought, wow, 1919 and women were so humiliated with this kind of non-person language and, you know, just ridiculous barriers. And um, I just had this incredible kind of moment of inspiration. I thought, wow, it's coming up. We have to make this moment count. 2019 is five years away or six, six years away. How can I really make something bigger than myself out of this? And I wasn't at this point even practicing. I was running this company. We probably had about 500 women that were returning to the legal profession. I was completely not, if you like, in the mainstream. But I guess because of that, I had the space mentally to be able to come up with something completely different. And I realized that by telling the story of the journey of women in law and taking it from the very beginning, I was quite systematic and almost like a litigator, really, you know, just going through my methodology, start from the beginning, who tried, when did they fail, when did we eventually arrive, who were the women? Um, nobody knew. And I realized we were for the first time piecing together a whole history that nobody had bothered about. Um, and it was about a year and a half of just foundation time, trying to piece together, find people that might have had some interest in some of the individuals we discovered. It, actually, my husband was probably my main researcher. <laughs> I was like, off you go to one of the inns and find out what you can find out. And that's really how it started. I was just intrigued by how this woman felt really being the only one among all these people. And I mean, my preoccupations, the questions that were crossing my mind were things like, you know, clearly they were having a dinner in 1982, everybody smoked, there was the kind of billiard room, the, you know, the kind of separation, you didn't have access as a woman to every place. We take it for granted now, but actually in 1982 was the, the year where the, the journalists sued to be allowed to, off, you know, um, get their own pint of beer at the bar. You weren't even being served at the bar if you're a woman. So I thought, you know, she must have been so excluded from all the moments of decision making and power. And so I tracked her down <laughs> as well. So that was part, you know, it took quite a while. And um, and I thought this is the opportunity to really revisit this history, highlight the achievement of women, put them on the map, and then the conversations can begin. But we have a bit of a foundation because I felt we in the diversity debate because I was in that business with my business, you know, around returning, why don't we have flexibility, all of these topics that are still going on, um, sadly, that there, there was this kind of opportunity of always shifting sands, you know, that, you know, that you were never sure whether you could really push the arguments because there seemed to always be another perspective. And I felt if we get the history right and we make it, you know, uh, we agree that this is kind of, you know, more or less the timeline. These are the, you know, this was the march of women. At least maybe that kind of shifting sand sensation that you get when you're trying to push for change. Maybe we remove a little bit of that and it feels a bit more solid as a start in life. Um, and I hope it will be empowering uh, ultimately. And it will just make people, especially women, feel a sense of belonging to the legal profession so they don't disconnect, they stay in and advance.
Yeah. And, and I do think you have done a huge service to women in the legal profession because I, I came into the legal profession in 1991, 1990, and it was really lonely. And it was lonely because there were women only robing rooms. So you weren't in the robing room when people were discussing a case before um, be beforehand. Um, you know, there were th different rules about what you could wear. I have, st I have been to a dinner in a judge's lodgings where the ladies were expected to retire after dinner. And I'm not that old, I don't think. So, you know, it was a sense of if you were allowed in, you were allowed into this world. It wasn't a question of the world reshaping itself around you. And I think it's that silence and exclusion that, I, that, that the project excited me um, when I first came across it in, in seeing those stories and in, and in hearing them in people's own voices. And so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you, you were talking to me earlier about the the concept of silence and, and lies in history and why that seems to you important. Well, I guess I, uh, I always had a kind of sense of history and what's missing because I grew up under communism and I always had, you know, um, this sense that history is being made up for the purposes of the ideology and um, what had to be the truth and we all had to believe it um, to be safe. And so I came to study history because I felt my history and my education in history had been edited and it had been tampered with by the regime um, as I was growing up. I was really interested in that and that's why I took my degree in history. There was no nothing else that interested me because I felt obviously, you know, you can interpret and there's a lot of nuance and, you know, you, you learn, that's why you go to school. But there were moments from history that were completely absent, you, all manufactured, you know, it could be one or the other, but I didn't know which one was true and which one was the lie. Um, and then, so when I came to the woman's history and the woman's story, I mean, it was a really painful process because actually there was more absence than anything. I mean, in a way we filled that gap. And in fact, my husband always says, you know, in a hundred years time, if people discover your project, suddenly they'll think it was all women. I said, yes, that's good because a hundred years of history, you know, hasn't really been told. I mean, it was so difficult. I mean, we only found the first photographs of the first woman to qualify as a solicitor in the UK, which is Madge, Madge Easton Anderson in Scotland. Um, only at the beginning of last, oh, the, of 2019, we managed to discover the first photograph. Nobody knew what she looked like. And it was only because of the project that the University of Glasgow started a mini project trying to identify their legal pioneers. And eventually somebody put forward the photographs um, of, of the first woman to qualify as a solicitor in the UK. We didn't have that until 2019. Mm -hmm. And that's unbelievable. And there were so many, you know, the only woman I think that had some good documentation to her was Helena Normanton because she actually was a bit of a holder. So she kept all her boxes and then she, you know, they've arrived at the LSE. Uh, but, you know, Rose Heilbrunn, who's another, you know, high profile, the first woman QC, she stopped writing her diary once she had a child, you know, so she, a lot of the kind of, if you like, the way history remembers people is through biography and what we leave behind is valuable to how we rediscover them. And I found there was this poverty of information, you know, women seem to have left nothing in the drawers that we can discover and suddenly, you know, make sense of who were the first, what were the motivations, and then you have the ones that were campaigners, you know, because I think, and definitely on the bar, bar side, because they obviously advocates. So you had people like Ivy Williams, who was an academic, so she wrote a bit more. You know, you had a few kind of snippets of um, local newspapers that would, you know, talk about one, you know, pioneering woman lawyer that went back to her school to give a talk or something like that, trying to, you know, encourage girls to, uh, to be educated. But very, very difficult to piece together a narrative around what happened to women over these hundred years and what has been, if you like, um, the progress, but also how rapid it's been. Because when you look now, you say, well, you know, we don't see so many women, there's not enough, you know, but there's only two women on the Supreme Court. Thank goodness, thank goodness to April 2021 that we have a second one, you know. Um, but uh, you know, when did it all start and why should we expect to have 12? Could that even be possible? Because actually when you look at the history and the way and the pace of advancement, it was so slow. You know, we were eventually qualifying around 1922, the first generation came in, a lot 
quit because the marriage bar forced them to. The minute you married, you were expected to leave. Um, and the ones that were standing, you know, they were the ones that came in later. So they retired earlier. And actually only in the 1960s, you know, we had something like a thousand women lawyers across the bar and the solicitor's profession. So out of a thousand women in the mid 1960s, how could you have a whole bench of, you know, we hadn't had a woman judge until 1965. You know, how could you have the Supreme Court? How could you have many more women represented? It was such a slow pipeline. Um, and that's what we need to be mindful because that history teaches us that unless we keep the numbers high, you cannot catch up. Yeah. You know, there's no nothing that you can put in place. And the absence then becomes, you know, um, a justification for why it is an impossibility. Yeah. And I think that sharing of experience is, is, is important. There's a, a, a woman called Eleanor Platt, who has always written to every woman who becomes a QC with the list, which for a long time was just a list that she kept. I think it is somewhere online now, very recently. And I was really surprised in 2010 when I became a QC. I think I was 202 or 212, something like that. And a colleague recently wrote to say, oh, I'm only 500 and something. But I thought, well, it's, it's more than doubled since, since I did it, which is really good. Um, mm. But that is such a, a tiny number over the whole history. You know, you suddenly realize how incredibly small it is and how it's not surprising that that's um, a lonely journey. So I think these stories are encouraging as role models. But you, you talked about absences and lies there's also curation and choice so how did you go about telling these stories and how which bits of them did you try to bring out well i think that's a very good point and a very good question it wasn't easy i mean we had to have a methodology because my um if you like the vision for the project and the way we started because i didn't realize whether it would you know whether it would take off and whether there would be interest and i didn't know if people were willing to participate and tell their full story rather than just the one side of the story and so I kind of started with an aspiration that we'll get to about 100 biographies of leading women first. Um, so that was, if you like, the methodology, which is not perfect, but it was a way of making sure that we at least are able to progress. We wanted to show, um, you know, in a way, different stories and different angles around um, socioeconomic background, you know, different routes to, to the profession from the judiciary, the bar, um, silex, you know, magistrates. So we wanted to really be from the beginning very much about the whole profession, because I guess that's one of the things I discovered um, once I joined. I want you when you were a solicitor, but you didn't really interact. I mean, obviously you would instruct counsel or, but it was a very kind of, um, there wasn't a lot of cross conversation. And I felt to me, in, I still believe this, that, you know, we cannot resolve one big challenge that actually operates across the profession by just trying to address it in one vertical. If we're not talking and not learning from one thing and to the other, and we're not passing this kind of best practice uh, within the legal profession in the widest possible way, we will always struggle. We will always struggle. We might crack one you know, thing about flexibility on the solicitor side, but it won't work for the bar. We need to understand it's a supply chain and it's really an ecosystem that needs to thrive together. So for me, I was really keen that we would look at, you know, in-house lawyers that are a rising powerhouse for the legal profession, really trying to understand also, there are so many ways in which you can be a lawyer. It doesn't need to be a one, you know, recipe. Um, but for me, it was really, and I didn't really know when I started. So I really just wanted to have let's aim for 100 biographies of first woman that broke new ground. That was kind of like the brief. But then as we started filming, we realized obviously all these women got to an incredible, you know, success story. But what was really wonderful was how differently they all arrived to that, you know, success of definition, you know, everybody understands different things, but they are invariably role models to others. You know, other people can really learn from them men and women, because I was keen that men would be caught into this kind of storytelling um, circle. So they don't feel alienated. They feel they're being fed some curious facts, but they prepare to you know, repeat them to other people and really spread the story. But I love the fact that I discovered so many routes and so many different kind of parts that people have taken to achieve what we would deem from an external viewer point of view a success and that to me was if you like um 
the kind of lesson of the whole project is to see you know how success is sweated you know it's not you know you can have some people that have come from maybe privileged backgrounds but there are a lot of people that didn't and actually it was how they approached difficulties the perseverance the resilience all these qualities and actually i think that is if you like the the lesson is you just they stayed in for us to be able to discover them and to build on their legacy rather than reinvent the wheel and I think for, from that point of view, I'm, I'm really grateful because they've been open, but also they've been open to talk candidly about not just the success, but also the path to get there, um, which wasn't really being told. I mean, now we have so many more initiatives around, you know, speaking out and being who you are. When we started and we officially launched in 2014, very few people knew, even, you know, let's say, you know, Lady Hale, who I know it was your guest, very few people knew a lot about her early life because we started having these conversations really in the last less than 10 years. But those stories are the ones that people will feel inspired by. They will identify with their life, maybe for losing a parent as an early, you know, in early in life or because, you know, having, um, you know, coming from a single um a parent family or maybe being a single parent themselves or having disabled children whichever way they found a way through and that's to me the message we need to pass on it you know however hard it gets you can you can do it mm-hmm. um and i felt they were able to do that through their through their stories yeah um do i forgot to say when i started i usually do forget to say but um we will have time for questions from the audience um I'm not going to hog the whole time myself, tempted as I am. So please do put them in the Q&A function and I can take them out um, as, as whenever. So to, if they occur to you, don't wait, don't wait for the end and for me to ask um, fire away. Um, but Dana, I wanted to ask that you were there's certainly a sense that you had to be a certain way for women in the law until quite or you were in somebody else's world and a sense of carefully curating your image. Yes, I have children, but I have good childcare or a supportive partner or yes I have taken time out but I've also and I just wonder how how far you felt that your participants were curating an image in that way and telling a a, 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 I guess a story with a moral and how far they you got them to open up to you and talk about some of the things that were harder as well as the my brilliant career and how I got here sort of story um well I guess I well, I, I'm hoping that we succeeded. I, I like to think we did and that we did get a, you know, less curated story of their life. But um, I used to be a journalist. And so I came to this project um, to humanize lawyers, really. That was, if you like, one of the things I noticed, for example, in my, you know, interaction with lawyers is that at work, they were very different people from their, you know, when I met them socially. And I thought, why is there this need to transform and become this kind of so different and much more guarded person in the work environment? And it seemed to be very, very specific to lawyers. Um, and um, it created a barrier and actually it creates a barrier with society because it, we don't really talk directly. We feel it's very moderated. And um, I hoped to succeed by using interviewing techniques and being a journalist rather than a lawyer in my conversations. Um, and also we in, worked, worked with a team of specialist TV people that came with a journalistic storytelling um, background. So for me, that was the main quality I was looking for in those that we worked with. It was really important to have people that understood the story, um, could make people comfortable to share their story and make them feel safe. But also, I guess that we articulate the importance of this moment and the opportunity to finally be able to share with the widest possible group of people, stories that are easy to identify with and, um, you know, to really inspire. And if you are guarded, then the likelihood is that you are raising barriers and you make it more difficult. Like I felt when I was in practice, I didn't want to be like anybody because they all seem to live a very different life or to have priorities that, you know, seem to discount my priorities. Um, and I felt that was 
one of the reasons why so many women disconnected you know they were saying well i have children now but they don't want women with children or you know there's no woman with children all the partners don't seem to have a family they're single i want to you know focus on on, on other priorities and they would then just leave and i thought well what, let's talk about what was really going on at home and one of my favorite uh, bits of film was when I, we were chatting to lady hale and we were filming her and you know i, I asked her what her daughter feels about her and and her achievements and, and her life and she was talking about how she was typing at night you know with, and the daughter was next door and they're just lovely stories that you wouldn't have necessarily heard 20 years ago you know nobody maybe they will talk over a, a glass of something after you know getting together because there were a lot of you know groups of women that were still trying to support each other but generally speaking you wouldn't put yourself on film to share that kind of story because people you would be worried that there would be prejudice or they would hold you back um and to me i wanted incredibly successful people that are objectively speaking recognized as such you know they are icons for our generation to give all the generations coming through permission to talk about themselves in the round um, and I think the only way to do that is to, to use stories and give them the space to be able to feel comfortable to share as much as they want. Um, and I think that was our approach. Yeah. Um, well, and so I hope you, it succeeded. Yeah. Well, I think it did. I mean, what as, as a viewer of those stories, and I find them absolutely fascinating, their little films, but also the uh, I mean, when, when I made one, I mean, I did feel supported in telling a human story. And I, I don't know if that's that I'm a bit older and I feel more comfortable in sh sort of sh sharing more vulnerable things because I think that's helpful for other people to know you're allowed or whether the movement the moment has changed and that your project is part of that I wonder if it is that we've sort of thought you know vulnerability is something that you should show as a role model not just your brilliant career and how you got there yeah I, I think the times have definitely changed I think the you know the importance of storytelling has definitely become much much more central around you know around society I mean I guess social media is making that possible especially on say you know video channels like Instagram or YouTube people can share their own story if they want um, but also corporates they become they're trying to be more humanized because I guess they realize that consumers are they connect to the brand more, more and they communicate more. And so in that sense, it's kind of, it's become a bit of a movement, so to speak, but we're definitely, I think at the beginning of it, reading ahead of time that storytelling was critical in how you share, um, but also how you give permission to other, other people behind to feel it's safe. Yeah. Um, it's safe to share something that you've never shared before. Um, and that was something that was definitely missing. I mean, when I think back, if I look at some of the people I worked with, you know, very rarely you would see uh, a woman partner with photographs of her family, you know, on display, but you would have the men not have any problem because they were there 24 seven, but mm -hmm. they had this kind of, you know, perfectly formed family that their probably ex, you know, um, lawyer wife was looking after as very often was the case. Um, and she had quit and he was thriving and that seemed to be the dynamic and um, it's so important to say that it's you know you can not have it all but you don't have to give up all your values to succeed yeah it's in, that may feed into a question I've got from um, Lara Garrett who says that it, it seems that um, uncovering the history of women in law is even more challenging than uncovering other aspects of women's history and she asked why, why you think that might be the case I, I don't know if that asked question about do you show vulnerability as a lawyer might be part of it but it may not be I don't know do well I think uh, one of the things is that there just weren't so many and as I said one of the biggest barriers and I think it's not necessarily just typical of women it's the same if you look at other professions um we just don't leave a trace um it's just something that's very deliberate it's something that i'm i think men because they have they're used to being in in positions of power and you know their diaries to count i mean i remember i counted um you know how long i mean we still haven't had Theresa may's diaries you know a man in her position would have already you know expounded on his, his views of the role he had but you have this kind of um a different approach towards legacy that women have compared to men. And I think we need 
to look into it and really think about why is this the case? And I think a lot of the, with, for example, as I said earlier, Ross Heilbrunn, who just, you know, kept a diary all her life until she had a child because she no longer had time. And suddenly, you know, not being able to collect your thoughts becomes actually a problem in creating your diaries or creating your autobiography, which again, we're much more shy, we're not used to it. You know, how many women are putting an autobiography out, you know, to just talk about, about themselves. You have, you know, if you look in politics, a lot of MPs backbenching, it doesn't matter how important they were, they will have something to say. And I guess, because we've been used to being silenced. Um, mm. And that is, you know, if you like the other, the other um, kind of discovery of the first hundred years is the silence of the voices of women, um, which is why I wish that the work could be done, but it cannot be done because those voices are still not being heard. Yeah. And, you know, there's this kind of idea of, obviously voice was a very big topic around women at the bar. You know, they're not fit to be barristers because their voice doesn't carry, you know, there's a whole, you know, bunch of humor around women and their voices and whether they can have authority because they're too high pitched and this and that. And um, being silenced was actually the under, uh, you know, the, the kind of undertone of all of those comments. Yeah. You had to change something to come across as the leader that people are prepared to accept or the professional that the people are prepared to accept. And I think that is one of the reasons why women don't put a whole lot of volume of information about themselves out mm -hmm. um, because they feel a sense of kind of public rejection almost, you know, why is your story worth telling? Um, and that is uh, something that we need to change, but how is, um, you know, is the kind of one million question really? I, I don't have the answer, but I think we need more voices to be heard. Yeah. Now, I, w I want to come back to that. Why is your story worth telling and what are we doing? But I just wanted to give you the second part of Lara's question, because she's asked especially um, if you, from the stories that were told, can elaborate on the different experiences as you perceive them, depending on whether people became solicitors or barristers, or I might add, or different kinds of lawyers or, or, or what kind of solicitors or barristers? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, uh, people from more privileged backgrounds, could go into the bar where you would have more scrappy backgrounds in, in the solicitor side and definitely in-house. So if you were, for example, like we had Sandy Okoro, a black woman solicitor, she was written off, you know, she ended up qualifying straight into in-house um, because people just told her black girls don't become judges, don't become lawyers. So I think there is a correlation between the perception of what a lawyer should look like and how much more difficult it was for, for them to come through. Um, or whereas you can have somebody like um, Elizabeth Butler Sloss, who was part of a kind of, you know, dynasty of lawyers, although she didn't have it easy, but at least she was close enough to know what was going on, what was the story from inside, um, you know, so she could still find a way back in um, even after she started quite late and then she returned in, in, you know, but she could navigate it because she had, if you like, the inside of you. Um, if you were from outside, it was difficult, as in, you know, completely difficult because it was financially difficult. Um, you had to pay for pupillage, you had to pay for so many things. Um, so I would say more of a chance to be picked up and, you know, taken under somebody's protection as an article clerk and just because they could see your value more quickly, you could produce money for them more quickly. Um, and also, I think the solicitors always, you know, um, would be brought in by the dads, you know, and encouraged to be continuing the family business. So they had, if you like, a start that was immediately generating income to the family, which yeah. was always helpful. Yeah. Now, I was talking about why is your story worth telling? What is the value of your story? Um, and one of the things you've been talking about is the value of a story to be a role model, to offer a past from which people might see a future. Um, we have a, um, an exhibition in Mansfield, when, when lockdown ends, and I, you come up, I hope you'll see it, um, about the history of the first 100 years of women at the university and the first 40 years of co-education in most of the Oxford colleges, including um, Mansfield. 
But one of the things that the history tutors here, I think rightly said is, it can't be a celebration of 100 years of women. It can't be a set, you know, that's, that's what, what we ought to be acknowledging is how slow the progress is, how disgraceful it is that it's only the first 100 years of women, the, the barriers we still face. What about women of colour? What about people from poorer backgrounds? We, we have to make it part of a history, not a celebration. But one of the things that you did, and I don't know how linked it was to the first 100 years project and how far it was something off on its own, was a wonderful piece of work, which I hope we might be able to get up if um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, Vanessa at Mansfield may be able to share her screen, but a piece of artwork that you helped to get into the Supreme Court, which is of, which was to celebrate the first 100 years of women. I think it's just going to come up on the screen now. Yes. And you can see where it is in the Supreme Court. It's it's in um, one of the two main courtrooms and it's facing the judges as they make their decisions. As you come in, this is the this is a judge's eye view of that um, portrait. And so the advocates are facing the other way in the public. But perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that artwork and who they are and, and why you thought that was an important thing to do. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, the idea was to create an artwork that um, marks the centenary but also moves us away from this idea of the one only woman to you know a group of women obviously um, the four the first one is um, Cornelia Sorabji um, she never really got to practice and qualify here um, because um, she was um, at Oxford but you know went back to India and she became a lawyer there second one is Rose Heilbronn I mean, I'm talking from the left, <laughs> left, yes. I think. I yes, that's right. Yes. Um, and uh, Rose um, became the first woman QC and the first woman recorder. And she was the first woman to sit at the Old Bailey, which I think it was in the 1970s. Um, and then we have Lady Hell, you know. And um, then the last portrait is the woman of the future. There's a student, I believe she's also at Oxford, um, but she's not you know she's a model and um it's our idea of you know the future of law is female but also looking forward and looking outside um to the future so we were very keen to well represent women in the stream court because there was nothing in the collection to show that women were present um in in the Supreme Court. Um, obviously, we only had um, Lady Hale join the House of Lords in 1999, so pretty late anyway. But um, this court, courtroom was particularly important for women because you had the first majority um, female panel in 2018. We had three women and uh, two men sitting um, in that decision, in, in that um, trial. So it was a really important room for us from a kind of marking a step change um, for women in the legal profession. But I guess for us, the main thing was something that was striking, it's modern, and gives us this kind of sense of history, but also individuality that e each one of them contributing in their individual way. You know, women could stand on their own, but also stand together, because one of the things that we often hear from, um, you know, other younger women is, you know, do women really help each other up? or are they getting into each other's ways? Do they compete or can they support each other? And we felt it's really important to show this kind of, you know, there's a, a history will help us bring us together irrespective of which generation we are, we can help each other across those generations. Um, and, uh, you know, we, it's great that we were able to commission and get this piece of work done. I wasn't sure we would do it because it's always expensive to commission art. But I, I'm really, really delighted that we were able to to fund it and make it happen. Um, it was um, quite an effort, but it's a very bright, happy artwork. I always think of it um, that way. Yeah, and it really is a celebratory piece, and it's really worth um, going to see if you ever happen to be on Parliament Square, because the Supreme Court is a public building, so we can all go in there and you all should, um, and it's in courtroom two. So, um, yeah, thank you for making that happen. I really do think it's um, important and it feeds into a question that uh, Miriam Kennett has asked and she says she has a publishing house and um, men are quite happy to send in their writing, assume it's good, and women um, often aren't or saying, is it, is it good enough? Um, but also they, they assume the value of the story is lower 
um, and if they have time to write it at all. But they, you know, she asked whether there's a sort of problem with women always facilitating other people, men taking the credit, and women thinking it would be arrogant of me to tell my story. It would be me bigging myself up or saying I'm important and that's not something that women like to do. And so they are lost and hidden from history. Uh, well, I think all of those things are true. Um, I think there is one other aspect where they are being told to be less noisy and they will be told, you know, they, they are assumed to be um, out for themselves in a way that I find is very off-putting and it does put a woman off because it is an extra effort to produce something. I mean, we wrote the first 100 years book as well to tell the story of what well, the project, but also the history of women in law. And it's an incredible effort. And so actually if women don't have the time to, you know, also it's like with, you know, everything when it comes to um, work allocation or opportunity allocation, so to speak, if you're asking a woman to write five chapters or a whole book before you commit, then you are, you are excluding, you know, because they are less likely to have the time to produce that much. So how do you guide them to tell their story in a way that doesn't make it impossible for them? Whereas a man might be able to produce five chapters to get in, a woman might not be able to do that. So it doesn't mean the story is not worth telling, but actually you are in a way telling that because the, the access barrier is too high. And some of the old rules are applying and still, you know, they're not inclusive. So the, you know, the publishing industry still operates maybe on old fashioned access um, requests where, you know, they disadvantage women because they're asking for too much too soon. Um, and the men have more time. I mean, you've seen that I'm sure in academia with the pandemic that there were a lot of studies that showed a lot of the women have fallen behind in writing and because they've had to pick up the childcare. Yeah. Um, so we are expecting a kind of huge drop in output from women um, because of the pandemic. And that's, you know, another reason why we, we have this absence because it, it just, it's just constant and it's reinforcing old old barriers, but it's an access. I mean, I think to me, that's what I see about the, you know, the, the act, the 1919 act, it was about access. And we still have the access problem, the access to equal opportunity, mm -hmm. to, or, to be a leader or to be equally paid or to be at the table, not being criticized. And I don't think we're too sensitive. I think we're just not, um, we're not playing on an equal playing field. No. And I think what, the point that Miriam made is, is right, that I think you're made to feel arrogant if you say something about me is interesting. And I think it's mm -hmm. one of the empowering and encouraging things about the First 100 Years Project that you can, I mean, I felt when I participated, I said, that look, show off. Like, well, no, it doesn't look, it's, this is a group portrait in a sense. It's, a, it's lots of voices and it's, it's just part of a patchwork. And that's something it's important to say you can do. And it's not saying, if you're trying to big yourself up, which I think is something that, women are told, including by other women and probably themselves, is perhaps a slightly unattractive thing to do. Um, can I move on? Because I think you were talking about um, wanting to have these stories told and to have role models. And I wanted to ask what you think the link is between knowing and having recorded our past and having that, having the stories and how we could go about creating our future. Do you think there is a link? I like to think that there is a link. I like to think that um, as we're trying to look towards where our place might be in the future, we feel supported by these stories of the past, you know, because I, I remember being asked questions around, you know, show, you know, tell me about women that contributed anything to history, you know, you know, there's so many men that have, you know, won the Nobel Prize and whatever, naming a woman, and you end up saying Marie Curie a million times, you know, because you just didn't have the the language to fire back a series of women. I mean, we are definitely in a much better position, but I think there's power in that, being able to fire back some really incredible stories. You know, talk about Helena Normanton taking the government to, to court for, you know, keeping her maiden name. We take it for granted. You can operate with your, you know, maiden name in the professions, but she took a, you know, deliberate act to say, I want to be Helena Normanton. I don't want to take my husband's name. Um, because she felt it was important to build her own identity as a professional, as a woman, 
um, professional, not as somebody's wife. And, um, you know, she felt she would be losing something by not keeping her name. No. Um, and I think they're just fantastic stories. You know, they're just sto stories of really, you know, gutsy women, you know, they went out and these days, I mean, those days when they did it, you just think, wow. But then you see them play out, you know, they take challenges around upskirting or, you know, flexible work and just going and campaigning that little bit further. I'm hoping that by seeing the women have done it before, you just get that bit, you know, that bit of wind in your sail, so to speak, just go and do it. You don't like something, change it. And I, I love that about them, that they, they, they did it, you know. Yeah. Well, but Bebel, I mean, Gwyneth Bebel has always been a role model for me and incidentally didn't get into the Dictionary of National Biography, I think, until 2012. Very, I mean, very. Yes. Yeah. But but I didn't know that story about Helena Normanton. I never knew there was a legal barrier to not taking your husband's name. So yeah. that's I mean, uh, to get to get the passport. So you needed to get the passport in the husband's name but she didn't like the idea of traveling on somebody else's <laughs> surname yeah um yeah. <laughs> and she you know she 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 put on a fight i mean the, the the downside of that and i'm hoping we also learn that is there is a little bit too much energy being burnt on these kind of battles so we end up you know again going back to the you know why don't we write as much it's because we're mostly exhausted um exhausted from the children exhausted from the world um, and from the numerous battles to remove some of these obstacles from our path. And, um, you know, sometimes um, I think it was um, RBG that said, you know, it's good to be deaf, more, more deaf, you know, not, not hear everything. Um, and I, I often say that to myself. I'm saying maybe this time I'm going to be deaf of that particular demand on my time. And, you know, is it something that you can change to save some of that energy to be more creative, more productive and create more impact? Um, because we spread ourselves so thin because of so many different kind of roles we play. Um, and I'm hoping that that's something we can learn from the, the generations from before, you know, how did they do it and how, how did they balance their energy to make sure that they could still advance? Yeah. I mean, do you think that something like the first hundred years project has also been powerful in creating allies because I'm, I'm thinking about this very much in in the in the context of advancing racial equality it can't always be black people who have to do all the work it's not fair it takes up too much headspace it sort of you know it can feel like especially pleading white people have to take some responsibility for racism too men have to take quite a lot of responsibility for sexism how do we get them to hear those stories men of goodwill and join the fight and I think this may be part of it I mean is that something that you thought about in this project or yeah for sure I mean again I think you know creating I don't you know telling it as it is always helps and not you know um not curating I think when you when I look at the kind of black history it's got the same problems that women's history has you know the the, the gaps the you know erasure the um the lack of role models the 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 fact that they haven't been written in um it's and also the kind of lack of opportunity the barriers to access those things we've been through and if you like i i'm always keen to say i recognize your barrier and your access struggle because actually i've seen it play all the way all, all the way with women it's not something they tend to play in the same way. I mean, slightly differently around, you know, maybe race, uh, but actually it's a, it's a way of saying, I don't want this competition. I don't want this playing field to be open to everybody. And we women have been there because in a way we were the first ones to kind of get through eventually. And now we can share that and say, look, there are actually things that you can do not to have to battle in the same way. And I agree with you, we should sit at the table. With men, I found passing on the knowledge, they like to show it off in, in the nicest possible way and giving them nice stories, anecdotes, they are then equipped to talk. You know, they, they need, the, they don't always have the tools because it's been, you know, something they were blinded to. They didn't really think about it, but actually being able to give them the tools to speak and pass on um, the stories and to, to appeal to their curiosity um, I find that's been very successful and really, I mean, my, my husband, for one, he said, you know, he's never heard about these women, no surprise, because our legal books didn't really feature any. 
Um, and uh, he, you know, he said, I've been radicalized by this project. I've discovered so many extraordinary women. It's so fantastic to, to, to see their stories. And, um, and that's really fabulous. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's I was did a, a, a talk about race today with a South African academic saying it, it's when white people realize they have been the beneficiaries of affirmative action for generations that they, they'll understand that equity and leveling the playing field is not special pleading. It's re, re, re tilting the scales to achieve some better kind of fairness pleading. But you need to see that experience until you can understand that. Um, I want to know what you're doing next. What what other stories and um, interests and avenues are you pursuing, um, Dana? So the first hundred years has morphed into the next hundred years. Um, not because we have a hundred years to wait for equality. Um, far far from it. Um, but because we, if you like, I mean, although you know, equality by economic studies is going to take more than a hundred years, which is why we called it next hundred years. Surely we cannot wait another hundred years. Um, so the project focuses on, I think, the areas that we have seen are big barriers. Um, a slightly different approach, I guess, from the previous one, although we still maintain the video format. Um, and that's focused on leadership stories, you know, really seeing women today talk about what it's like to lead an organization. We've seen quite a few interesting appointments. Actually, even this week, we had my old firm appoint their first senior partner woman. She follows after another Magic Circle law firm. So, you know, suddenly we're seeing some very visible role models. Um, coming through and it feels like a really wonderful moment to capture and really pass on you know a different kind of lesson if you like of what it is to be in the present and be at the top of a you know two billion law firm um it's a really interesting different conversation to be had and uh, so we're focusing on that we're focusing on um the female voice and the authority with which she speaks her field of expertise um, I'm really interested in the brilliant minds of the women, you know, very often, obviously, in the first 100 years, we highlighted them as women in law, whereas I want to now focus on the kind of lawyer in the woman in law um, and what they can speak to um, as public speakers, you know, can you bring um, last year, for example, we had our first inaugural lecture uh, named after Rose Halbron, um, and it was on the topic of freedom. Um, and we had a, a barrister talk about freedom from her perspective. We don't have a very descriptive way in which we say you have to tackle it, but it's about really having the opportunity to, you know, really share your brilliant mind with the widest possible um, public. And we make them public and we make them free so that lawyers are accessible to the widest possible audience. And so they can hear and see women outside of the court talking on things that are relevant, you know, freedom for us. We set the tone, um, the, the theme at the beginning of last year, thinking of the American elections in a completely different scenario. And then before we knew it, we were all with no freedom to move anywhere. Um, and it just was a really interesting topic to explore. Um, and all the kind of legal aspects around the COVID legislation. There was so much law in freedom last year um, that we didn't envisage. And it was just a really wonderful way to explore um, a legal experts but a woman um, uh, talk about it. And so our focus is about creating this bank of voices of women, giving them the platform um, to be more visible to the widest possible public. And then there's the kind of, if you like, um, a focus around diversity and what does good practice look like across the profession? profession? What are we measuring? We're talking about this and that numbers, um, but is it making change at the deep end? You know, is it really shifting things? And are we better off maybe having a unified system that we all agree? You know what? You know what good things we could measure, and find a way of communicating again across the professions rather than in our individual side of the legal profession to learn that actually. If the solicitor profession doesn't work, or even if it does work, it doesn't mean that the bar will work, or the government legal service, you know, department will work, or that the judiciary will work. They need to work together because actually we are providing talent across these different um, sides of the profession um, 
and they are, you know, moving in a kind of nice circle. Um, and we can't fix one side without fixing all sides. Um, so that's kind of our focus, but definitely stories and highlighting and celebrating, I think women don't stop to celebrate enough, actually. Um, I, I kind of quite like the coaching methodology of, you know, remind yourself how much you've got done. And I feel we're so rushed all the time that we forget to stop and say, you know what, that's been an amazing journey. And what do we build next um, on the back of that, rather than trying to think of where the beginning should be, which is always, you know, ground zero. Um, so I'd like it to be a continuous story, really, um, to allow us to build on the past and to shape our present and leave a better future for our kids. Yeah. Well, Donna, thank you. I really, I am so uh, impressed and inspired and um, entertained by the stories <laughs> that you have put out there and made a human face and made in, in, in answer to that question, what 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 have I got done? When you look at the first hundred years project, you think I, I'm part of that. That's it's it's, a, it's not just one person pushing a stone; it's a lot of people and their stories together make make a movement, make a social change. And I'm really grateful to you for capturing that in a way that I think has a has an effect on the on the future that that we create. I remember in a history degree somebody saying the past and the present combined to make the future that's the point really so i don't think i can do much better than um summarize with what's just popped up in the comments question and answers to say so interesting thank you so very much very very useful and inspiring so thank Aww. you very much um dana that was terrific um next week um we have um paul solman and um uh, Joe Klein, who wrote um, Primary Colours, Paul Solomon is an HS, uh, is, is a public service broadcaster in the United States, and um, uh, Joseph Klein, the author of Primary Colours, and they'll be talking about reporting America today. So that's half past five um, next week. Uh, and do please um, come, tell people who might have been interested, they can watch this again on YouTube um, from Monday. And uh, we look forward to seeing you um, for another Mansfield Talk. Um, either online or we hope in due course in person. So thank you all very much for coming and thank you, Dana. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you.